Every day we lose about 85,000 brain cells and we only generate about 1,400. Thankfully, the healthy brain has over 100 billion cells. So what can we do to help tip the scales in our favor? Well, there are a number of risk factors for dementia, which are modifiable. So things that we can actually do to help delay the onset of dementia or to slow its progression. And that's what I'll be reviewing in this video. So the term dementia, this is an umbrella term. It's used to describe a group of symptoms that impair your memory, your ability to think, and also to make decisions. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Now, there are other forms of dementia, which include vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and also frontotemporal dementia. Age is the strongest risk factor for dementia, particularly Alzheimer's. So your risk for Alzheimer's doubles every 10 years after age 60. And if we look at the distribution of Alzheimer's disease, 85% of these patients are at least 75 years old. Obviously, we have no control over this. As we age, our risk for dementia increases, period. But dementia is not a normal part of aging. And what is the role of genetics in dementia, and specifically in Alzheimer's? It does play an important role in your risk for getting dementia, especially Alzheimer's disease. For instance, if you have a parent who has dementia, then you have an approximate twofold increase in the relative risk of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Now let's talk about modifiable risk factors where we can actually have an impact. Evidence has suggested that interventions that we put into place, so those that are specifically targeted toward major modifiable risk factors, are likely to delay the onset of clinical Alzheimer's and dementia, and also to slow the progression of dementia. Of all the modifiable risk factors, those which fall under the category of cardiometabolic risk factors, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, those are always going to be at or near the top of the list. And hypertension or high blood pressure, this one is usually cited as being the most important, especially when we're talking about vascular dementia. And vascular dementia is caused by damage to the vessels in your brain, mainly your arteries. And having long standing untreated high blood pressure can cause those tiny arteries that dive deep into the white matter of your brain to harden, to have plaques, and even to rupture, causing these little microscopic bleeds. Now, these are usually not symptomatic, but if you have repeated insults, to the white matter of your brain over years, eventually you will reach that tipping point. And the way that this manifests is trouble remembering new things, trouble learning, you have a hard time problem solving, your thinking slows, you have difficulty with walking or with balance. Now remember, this is a white matter issue to be distinguished from Alzheimer's disease, which is a gray matter issue. And if you look at how prevalent this chronic white matter disease is, you'll see anywhere from 10 to 40%. Additionally, when you have untreated high blood pressure, your risk of having a stroke increases by about 50%. And why is this important? Well, about 10% of patients who've had a stroke will develop dementia after their first stroke. And about one-third will develop dementia if they've had more than one stroke. So you can see just how important controlling your blood pressure is. Now let's move on to physical activity and its role in preventing or delaying dementia. And in this area, there's an extensive amount of research that has been conducted. So it's been conclusively proven that aerobic exercise reduces vascular risk factors. So risk factors which could potentially have damaging effects on your arteries and veins. And as I mentioned earlier, vascular dementia accounts from anywhere between 10 to 40 percent, probably more along the lines of 25 to 30 percent. So it's not hard to see just how physical activity can protect the vessels in your brain. But does physical activity play a role in protecting the brain cells, so the neurons and their connections, which are called synapses? It has been demonstrated that regular exercise confers what's called neuroplasticity on the neuronal networks in the brain. All this means is that the nerve cells, the neurons, have more connections, so more brain cells talking to each other. This is a good thing. And in addition to these connections, besides being greater in number, these synaptic connections, and this is where the rubber meets the road, these connections are tighter. So think of it as having 
four reception bars on your cell phone as opposed to one. Physical activity has consistently been identified as one of the modifiable risk factors that has the greatest impact on reducing rates of cognitive impairment and dementia. With that being said, what are the recommendations on physical activity? It's 150 minutes of vigorous aerobic and or resistance exercise per week. Okay, so now let's shift gears to mental activity and its role in potentially delaying the onset of dementia. Several studies have shown that those who've had a higher level of mental and social interaction were less likely to develop dementia. Some examples of these activities would fall under the categories of things like learning a new language, taking formal classes, attending organizational type activities, also spending quality time with family and friends, going out to eat with family and friends, and also attending special family occasions where you have to socially interact with family and friends like weddings or birthday parties. A really interesting finding is that higher educational levels were associated with a lower risk of dementia. So the theory here is that sustained cognitive stimulation through early life and also possibly in later life may help build what's called cognitive reserve. So it's thought that the brain builds these alternative nerve pathways, which may allow people to better compensate for a loss of brain cells as they age. Now let's move on to the role that sleep plays in our theme of trying to stymie dementia. Good quality sleep. This is a big component that we really need to consider. And when this topic is broached, we tend to immediately focus on insomnia. And for good reason. This is a very common disorder that can not only have detrimental effects on your cognitive functioning, but also on your quality of life. However, this is not the only sleep-related disorder which has been linked to a decline in memory. And this topic is one that hits home for me personally. And that's because I have three different sleep-related disorders which have been linked to dementia. Insomnia, sleep apnea, and restless leg syndrome. And for me, if any one of these three is not controlled on any particular night, the next day I'm struggling. I can definitely feel the effects. So starting with insomnia, several important strategies to employ would be, number one, set a sleep schedule that works for you. Go to bed and wake up at the same time. Also set aside 30 minutes before bedtime to wind down. And this will play out differently for different people. For some, it might be some mild stretching or maybe some very light reading. Whatever works for you. It's also important to get an adequate amount of sunlight during the day. Basically, rise when the sun rises and wind down and go to bed when the sun goes down. Also, avoid alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine before bed. Another thing is to make your sleeping environment as comfortable, as peaceful, and as dark as possible. During good quality sleep, something very, very special happens within the brain. Findings suggest that deep sleep helps the brain to clear away twice as much metabolic waste, including beta amyloid. Beta amyloid is the hallmark finding in Alzheimer's disease. And as I mentioned earlier, restless leg syndrome and sleep apnea have also been linked to dementia. With regards to restless leg syndrome, especially nightless restless leg syndrome, this is usually diagnosed with an overnight sleep study. And a lot of times the patient doesn't even realize that they have restless leg syndrome. Sometimes it's the spouse who will comment on the kicking at night. So if someone has mentioned this to you, or if you find yourself waking up with a dull, heavy head and having trouble with fatigue or staying awake during the day, you might want to discuss the possibility of your having restless leg syndrome with your doctor. And the same can also be said for sleep apnea. A lot of times someone has witnessed you sleep and they might mention to you that you stop breathing for long periods of time, sometimes up to a half a minute or so, or sometimes you'll wake up at night suddenly gasping for air. And again, you may also wake up with a dull, heavy head or have trouble staying awake during the day, or you may fall asleep while driving. If this is you, talk to your PCP about it. And now onto the topic of diet and specifically the Mediterranean and DASH diets. So DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So findings from several studies suggested that the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, which is a hybrid Mediterranean DASH diet, substantially slow cognitive decline with age. And two observational studies show that the MIND diet was associated with a decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. 
However, both of these studies were observational, which means that they cannot indicate cause and effect. They can only detect associations. That notwithstanding, it's still an encouraging finding. And there have been other studies, one which found that middle-aged adults who closely adhered to the MIND diet had faster information processing speeds than those who did not closely follow the MIND diet. And just last year, there was another study which concluded that adherence to the MIND diet was associated with a slower rate of cognitive decline after having had a stroke. Since these studies were published, there have been a slew of books which have been written about the MIND diet. And instead of delving into all the nuances of the MIND diet, since this is kind of a long video, I'll leave a link to it down below if you're interested. Next up, we have obesity. Now, there is an association between obesity and dementia. And usually when we think about obesity, we think about the effects that it has on the heart, like coronary artery disease. But if you think about it, you've got arteries coursing throughout your entire body, including your brain. It has been shown that midlife obesity increases the relative risk of dementia by about 50%. Therefore, if you are obese or overweight, you can employ the two strategies that I mentioned earlier. Increase your physical activity to about 150 minutes of vigorous exercise, if you've been cleared by your doctor, and to seriously think about taking up a diet like the MIND diet, or consider consulting with a registered dietitian who can help you craft a healthy, reduced calorie diet. Now, another thing that we need to consider is depression. There is evidence that suggests that depression is associated with an increased risk for dementia. In particular, late life depression was associated with an increased odds of all types of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. A very recent large study found that depression elevated the risk of dementia by 51%. And in the same study, those depressed participants who received treatment for their depression had a 31% reduced risk of dementia compared to those participants who were not treated for depression. The take-home message here is that if you are depressed, seek help. This means make an appointment with your primary care doctor to discuss this and possibly get a referral for some counseling. Another somewhat undervalued risk factor regarding dementia is that of hearing loss. It's been shown that peripheral hearing loss may be a risk factor for the development of dementia, independent of age or other confounding factors. According to The Lancet, which is a very well-respected medical journal, hearing loss is one of the top risk factors for dementia. It's been postulated that hearing loss causes undue stress on the brain, causing it to strain to hear and to fill in the gaps on what's, what's not heard. And this may come at the expense of some other thinking or memory systems. Another thought is that hearing loss leads people to become less socially engaged, which is vital to remaining intellectually stimulated. If you can't hear, you may not go out as much, so the brain is less engaged and less active. Interestingly, though, it's not yet known whether hearing aids or other interventions to help with hearing loss will help to prevent the onset of dementia. Currently, Johns Hopkins is conducting a study to determine just this. But irrespective of these findings, if you have experienced hearing loss, definitely discuss this with your primary care physician and get a referral to an ENT specialist or an audiologist. Now let's talk about alcohol and dementia. If you look at the available data and the studies, you kind of get a mixed bag of results. However, you can find a couple studies out there which have found that wine was associated with a decreased risk of dementia. In one meta-analysis of prospective studies, the lowest risk of dementia was associated with the consumption of approximately a half a serving or approximately three and a half ounces of wine per day, while excessive drinking, which would amount to about 15 ounces of wine per day, was associated with increased dementia. Generally, it's recommended that if you are a non-drinker, don't take up drinking, even a small amount, as, as a way to prevent dementia. And if you are a current drinker, drink in moderation. Now we move on to vitamin supplementation. What is its role, if any, in delaying the onset of dementia? Some observational studies have found an association between higher intake of dietary antioxidants and a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And these findings led to an interest in assessing the potential role of supplemental antioxidants. 
in multiple large randomized clinical trials in older individuals who had either normal cognition or mild cognitive impairment, supplementation with a variety of antioxidant vitamins, including vitamin E, vitamin C, beta carotene, and selenium, showed no impact on delaying cognitive decline or dementia. In this video, I've reviewed a number of different measures that you can take to help prevent or delay the onset of dementia. It's my hope that what I discuss today will resonate with you and that you will take the necessary measures to ensure that you best position yourself to fend off this terrible constellation of signs and symptoms known as dementia.